Good morning, church. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. When you wake up Sunday morning, do you wake up thinking, yes, today I get to go to the house of the Lord? You know, that's the heart of God's people, that we're excited to come together and worship him. We're excited uh, to fellowship one with another. And today is an awesome day. We're looking forward to uh, potluck together this afternoon after the service. And we're looking forward to Dr. Kath sharing with us of the power of Pentecost today. And so when we wake up Sunday morning, I trust it's with joy in our hearts that we get to come together. As David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I want to start by reading a scripture this morning, Romans 15, 13. And it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That's the heart that we should have, that the God of hope fills us with joy and peace that we believe. So that the power of the Holy Spirit, you, so that in the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And that's our heart's cry this morning, that the Holy Spirit gives us power to have that hope that is found only in Christ. Why don't you stand with me? We're gonna sing of uh, the name that gives us hope, Jesus Christ. Let's worship him this morning. thank you for the victory that we have, the victory that is ours when we come through Christ. No matter the situations we face, we know that we are victorious through Christ. 
the blood that he shed on Calvary that makes us uh, know that we have an eternal hope. We have the a future in glory. And so we rejoice that no matter the situations we face here, we are victors in Christ. And that there is hope in no other name but Christ alone. So this morning, we give you praise. We ask that you would touch each person who's here this morning, those who are watching online, those who are sick, those who are facing uh, chronic illness, and those who are facing serious illness. Father, we pray your touch upon them, that they would know that you are victorious, and you are the one who heals. You're the one who brings deliverance. You bring salvation. Father, there is hope in Christ alone. And so we give you praise this morning. We ask that your anointing would be upon this service today, that you would anoint Dr. Kath as she preaches, that our hearts would be open to hear what you have to say to us this morning. And we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Everyone said? Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated this morning. We want to remind everyone that this morning is our communion Sunday, so if you're at home, you'll want to prepare that. We're going to call our ushers forward to bring our communion. We believe in open communion here at Northwest. That is, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't need to be a member here. But we all hold our emblems and we'll wait and Pastor Jonathan will come with the devotional and then we will partake together. Uh, just before we go into our song about this, I want to remind any Kingdom Kids here today, ages 3 to 12, that Kingdom Kids is starting and they are upstairs in the Kingdom Kids room. Uh, so we're going to turn our hearts to communion right now. We want to make sure that our hearts are right with God, that there's nothing standing between us and Him. Let's just turn our eyes towards Him this morning as we sing, He was nailed to the cross for me.
Praise the Lord. Just let those words sink into your heart that he was nailed to the cross for me. That he did this, it was a very personal thing that he did. And Hebrews reminds us that even it was for the joy that was set before him, that he endured the cross, despising the shame. What was the joy? Well, in Luke's gospel, we see that joy is so closely connected with our salvation. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And when one sinner comes to repentance, there's much joy in heaven with the angels of God. And so I just want to remind you this morning that he did it for you and for me, for the whole human race, the savior of the world. But those who discover it, those who find it, who take it for themselves, who say yes to God's gift, we know it was for me. It was for you. But isn't that, that's an awesome, what an awesome message we get to tell others. It was for you. It was for you and for me. Today we're going to continue our, the last of our series on Jesus' words from the cross. Uh, and in Luke chapter 23, 46, we see that Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. These obviously are the wor last words of Jesus that we have. We've looked through all seven. The Gospels have Jesus um, at, in Luke's Gospel saying, Father, forgive them. Uh, they don't know what they are doing. So he's, being, he's nailed to the cross. Remember, he did it for us. They don't understand this yet. They don't understand why this is happening. And they also don't understand who I am. But that will come. That, that revelation of that will come. And so after that, we have Jesus declaring, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This, this, the terrible consequences of sin laid upon Jesus. And yet, even there, he's not thinking simply about himself. He's thinking about other people. And so he reconciles with, with John, or reconciles, I should say, brings together his mom um, and his, his best friend, John. And we looked at that as well. And we've looked at how Jesus willingly took the punishment upon himself uh, as he drinks from, from the cup. We looked at that last couple of times. Uh, and... He noted, it is finished. There is no other work that could be done for our salvation, no amount of work, no, no number of good things that you could do to earn salvation with God. But God gave it as a free gift in Christ. Jesus laid his life down for you and for me. And I want you to know it wasn't, God didn't sacrifice his son who was unwilling Rather, Jesus said, yes, I will go for them. You know, in, Isaiah's, in Isaiah 6, G, uh, God says, who will go for us? Who will tell others? And Isaiah says, here am I, Lord, send me. Well, I want you to know he's reflecting the heart of God. Jesus himself says, I'll go. I'll go for them. And here at the end of his life, he says, Father, it's been good. You are always good. And into your hands, I commit my spirit. He's going to a place we will never have to go to. He died a death we will never have to die. He did it for you and for me. And he says, Father, I trust you, for you are always with me. You are always working. And what happened? Three days later, God raised him from the dead. And so no matter what we go, to, go through, we can follow Jesus in this. You can trust the Father, that he knows what you're going through. He sees it, and there's coming a day where he will call an end to the difficulty. The trial will end. But also our lives, which sometimes are confused. We don't understand how all the pieces fit together, but he does. Can you give your lives into, your, into his hands? Can you commit your cares and your sorrows to the Father and say, here's my life, here's my circumstances, here are my troubles, I put, give them into your hands because I know I can trust you. And you know what? No one who ever trusts in the Lord will ever be disappointed. And we will also not be moved because we placed our faith on the rock, Jesus Christ. And so today, as we celebrate communion, recognize 
our Savior, what he has done for us. What no one else could do, what we could not do for ourselves, he did for us. But this was the plan and the purpose of God. And the love of God is so beautifully displayed. When we come back, we come full circle as God says, Jesus says to the Father, forgive them. And he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I commit it all. And that's where we need to go to as well. We receive his forgiveness and we also commit everything into his hands. So we're going to read our text, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together of the bread. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for sending Jesus. And Jesus, we give you thanks for willingly going to the cross for us that you died for us. You died for me. You died for everyone here. You died for the world. And God, what an incredible, how incredible you are, how incredible the good news is that goes to everyone. Let us receive it today, even as we partook of the bread. We received it into our lives, into our, we took it in. Lord, we receive you today. We receive the grace that is poured out upon us. We receive the gifts that you give us. We receive all that you have for us today. With, all, with arms open wide, we say yes to you. And Lord, we bow our knee before you. And Lord, we also appreciate that, Lord, we're called to, to follow you. We're called to even suffer with you. It doesn't bring about our salvation but Lord, it will be worth it. The Lord, when others see that this, the message of the cross is worth suffering for, it's, you are worth it. God, we thank you we get the privilege of suffering with for Jesus as well for the sake of the gospel. Lord, let us appreciate that. Let us appreciate that, Lord, we, as we partake of the new covenant and we say, yes, we have a home in heaven but we also have a journey here on earth to travel. And Lord, you are faithful and you are good all along the way. And when we don't understand, let us with Jesus say, into your hands I commit this. Casting our cares on Jesus for cares for us, who helps us. And so God, we thank you that you make sense of the confusion of our lives. And one day you will explain it all. But God, in the midst of all this, you make things right for us. You take away our sin. You pour out your grace, and you give us of your presence, and we thank you, Lord, for this. We thank you for communion. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your people. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just before we turn our hearts to worship, we want to uh, share with you a few announcements, and perhaps it's more than a few today as we kick off our new semester. So, of course, we first want to remind you of our potluck lunch that's today, and everyone is welcome. If you forgot to bring food or you didn't know about it, please join us. I think all of us would rather eat a little bit less so that everyone can participate, and uh, it's always a great time to meet together, get to know each other a little bit better. Also, we're starting our midweek Bible study. So Tuesday morning, ladies have their Bible study at 9.45. I know they're excited. They were ready to go last week already, so this week it starts. 9.45 Tuesday, ladies, you'll want to be there. And Wednesday night, we have Bible studies for the whole family. The adults are in the main fellowship hall studying Revelation. Our youth are upstairs, and our, ki our kids have Kids Club as well. And I know they're going to have a great time. On Thursday this week, Season Saints, those 50 and older... You are considered seasoned. You've got a lot of salt. You've got a lot of wisdom. Uh, you are welcome to come Thursday from 2 to 3.30 for a special drop-in time of coffee and fellowship and just enjoy some time together. And then, as I mentioned last week, sorry, I might have missed this announcement there. The choir is starting this 
Thursday. So Thursday, those of you who can sing, please come on out at 7 o'clock till 9 o'clock. And you'll want to make sure that uh, you attend this week because the week following that is WM. And then the next week, the 28th, is the deadline. So you don't want to miss the opportunity uh, to be involved in our Christmas musical. And uh, that is coming up at Christmas time. Also, this Friday is our youth kickoff, and so we want to encourage all the youth to come and attend that. It's going to be a great time. They're meeting here at 7 p.m. on Friday. And just a heads up for next Sunday, I want to let you know the young adults are having a lunch and Bible study here after the service. And for anyone who's able, we are going to be having a prayer walk. We're meeting here at 6 o'clock next Sunday, and we'll spend a few minutes in prayer together, and then we'll go around our community praying for our community and for those that are within the community, and we'll come back here for the last 10 minutes or so as well. So please put those things on your calendar. Make sure you're aware of them so you can participate in all those different activities. And at this time, we're going to call our ushers forward for our tithes and offerings. As we focused on communion today and the sacrifice that Christ has made, you know, how much of a sacrifice is it for us to give a little bit back to him? You know, God asks us to give of our time and to give of our money. And so it's a blessing to be able to give to Christ, even sacrificially, as we open our pocketbooks and give to him of our tithes and offerings this morning. Let's pray over the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed us so immensely, the sacrificial love of Jesus, that he went to the cross willingly. He said, here I am, I will go. Father, I pray that you would find us with a heart that is uh, willing to please you, willing to serve you, that we're willing to even be sacrificial and say, here, God, here's my pocket bill, here's my money, here's my life. Let us give all that we have to you because you are so worthy. And I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives so that we would have a spirit of generosity, a spirit of giving, uh, to give back from what you've given to us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. see you guys again. This is my first time leading worship since being back. Um, some new faces, which I love to see. Um, so if you don't know this about me, I'm a student care pastor at the school, which just means I counsel students when they need it. And in our meeting this last week, uh, Dr. Kath brought this concept forward of um, getting into the room, um, where basically you just walk into the room and you're honest with yourself and those around you about how you're feeling. I encourage you to do that before God today, whether you're feeling really joyful, um, not so joyful, anything in between, I encourage you to bring that before the throne of God. Yeah, so uh, yeah, stand with me and we're going to sing Blessed, Intr Blessed Assurance. my 
into the room. If there is something that is difficult for you to uh, work through, this is what people are for. This is what the family of God is for. So whether it's physical healing, emotional support, whatever you need, come bring it to your brothers and sisters.
your mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God I saw led me through the fire in darkest night you were close like no other I've known you as a father and I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God Of the goodness of God. Your all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath. Of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything.
There's so much power behind uh, behind the Holy Spirit, behind God. But we can't just bottle it up. Like, as much as it is for us, it's also our job uh, to share it with others. And so that's a perfect lead-in uh, to I Speak Jesus.
upon that name that we uh, that we come to you, that we worship, and that through all things, things are made new. So Lord, I just pray that everyone here would be receptive to your voice and to your touch, Lord. That it wouldn't just uh, be a, a Sunday thing, Lord, but we would leave, we would leave this building feeling empowered and reliant on you, Lord. Reliant on you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, me and tech. Okay. Anyway. Um, you know, it has been so good in God's presence today. This is our Sunday kickoff for a new semester and another year. And I, I have to say it has been so good. It's, it's God's doing. I don't claim any credit for it. But just think this morning, even already what we've experienced, we got to celebrate communion together. We've had a great time of worship. Now we get to hear a great word from Dr. Kath. She's going to come up and share. I, I know I'm, I've been looking forward to this. It's a time where I too will be fed. I know that. Um, and I it's just, I just want you to, you know, focus in and be ready to receive peace, joy, receive good, the goodness of God as, as Dr. Kath comes and opens the word of life. But then I also want to, re, want to remind you, we have a potluck and we're all going to be fed in our stomachs. <laughs> so, I mean, it just, I'm not saying it's better and better, but it's good. It's so good. Come on up, Dr. Kath. Thank and you. And I know um, it's, it is absolutely our privilege to have her uh, speak to us today. Thank you. So, Aww. Do you know how much I love coming to this church? I love this church. I love to worship with you. Oh my goodness, I don't know if I've ever been in a congregation that sings like you do. It is just absolutely a joy. And this summer, I got to play guitar almost every single Sunday. Thank you very much, Hunter. <laughs> now you can have a turn. But I got to sit up there and be able to actually look at you while you were in worship. You love the Lord. It's written all over you. And that's a really cool thing. Really cool thing. I am so thankful as I stand here this morning for the things that God has done for us. The things that he has done in our family. For the provision do you know, in all these years, we've done ministry and sometimes we lived on peanuts, but we have never missed paying a bill. God is our great provi provider. He's our healer. He's our protector. He's everything that we need. And I just really want to just take a minute and, and have you join me in worship. So, Father, we just want to say... You are wonderful. You are the Prince of Peace. You are all that we need. Even in the darkest times, you are everything that we need. You are faithful. You are trustworthy. You are holy. You are good. You are majestic. You are awesome. You are mighty. You are almighty all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent, everywhere. Whether I am in the highest of highs or the lowest of lows, you are always there with me. Thank you for the pre your presence in my life. And I want to ask you if you would join me now in asking that as I speak, the Spirit of God will fall on us. When I look at Pentecost, I see that the Spirit of God fell on all of them. You need Him as much as I need Him. And so I'm going to ask you to join with me singing that. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit
thank you, Father, that you do that for us. Thank you for your presence in the room right now. Thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. We worship you. We love you. We want to honor you. May the words of our mouths and the meditation in our hearts be pleasing to you, our Lord, our God, our Father, our Savior, our Counselor, Prince of Peace, our coming King. All glory to you, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I actually asked Hunter to uh, sing that last song, I Speak Jesus, which you might think that it is not um, really fitting for speaking on Pentecost, but today we're actually going to be looking at a testimony rather than preaching a sermon. And so here's my testimony. I'm going to get in the room right now. Here's my testimony. I talk about it a lot because it was so life-altering for me. We went through a very difficult time in this last year. I know that some have, have noticed and have talked to me, and I've appreciated you. I've felt loved. But during that time, we often spoke that name. Spoke that name. Yes, we did. We sang that song and spoke the name. And when I did, I was just like, if I could, if I could have doubled the length of my arms, Jesus, I speak your holy name. And and I I was just I was struggling so hard, and. Uh, went through the time coming out of the woods and just recently God has done such good things in our family and just like when a forest fire burns and you see nothing but the black until the new life starts to grow because the forest fire was needed to burn all the stubble and and stuff that keeps the ground from getting the nutrients that it needs just like that as I as I saw sat lived in that, in that place of just what felt like devastation at the time, the new life started to spark, and God started to work, and God started to redeem all of those things. And here's what I noticed. As we came out of it this time, the, the song played on my car radio, or probably not the radio, Probably I had my Spotify on or something. Anyway, the song started to play. And, uh, I mean, I, d I bellow that song. It would be embarrassing if any of you were in my car with me. But I would bellow that song. And what happened was, as I was singing, like generally we think of the Holy Spirit coming down into us. For me, it was like I sensed the Holy Spirit coming up like a rod of strength in me. And it was just like, oh, my goodness. At the time I was struggling so hard, I didn't even realize what the Spirit of God was doing for me. But now I see what the Spirit of God has been doing for me, giving me an unnatural strength to be able to meet the challenges of the day. God is so faithful. That's my little bit of a testimony. Now I'm in the room, Hunter. But I want to uh, tell you about, well, first I want to tell you about something. You see the fire there. Yesterday and Friday, we had a retreat with our PCC program. And um, I just love a fire, especially when it's in a fireplace and I don't have to be outside with a mosquito. So it was really good yesterday because it was in a fireplace. That's why you see a fireplace fire there. And as I, Doug had just started the fire, and it was just little pieces of, of kindling that were starting, starting to catch fire. So it was just a little fire, but he had put logs that were larger in there. And uh, as it was starting to take, he left, and it was starting to take flame. For some reason, none of the other students wanted to be sitting there. I don't know, maybe thought they thought it was too hot. Incorrect. So as I sat there by myself, I just watched the fire for a while, just calm, soothe, soothe, get relaxed. And I was watching as it was starting to grow, as other logs were getting, catching the flame. And I thought, isn't that kind of what it's like with the Holy Spirit when you look at Pentecost? It's like 
they were in the upper room, the disciples, the ones that Jesus had told to wait, and they're waiting and praying when suddenly flames appeared on their head. Fire, isn't that interesting? And they started to speak in tongues. It sounds like it caused quite a commotion. I mean, they drew a crowd. They're all speaking languages. It's like they didn't even know what they're saying. They just were speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't think they knew what that meant exactly at the time. We've developed theology and doctrine to help us to understand it simply, but at the time, I don't think they understood that. Maybe. The Holy Spirit was there, and he's a teacher, right? I'm guessing. So as I sat and I watched that fire burn, and I watched it get bigger and bigger, it struck me that one log could kind of burn, but as they joined together, they got bigger and higher, and the more logs that there were, the bigger that fire got. And I thought, you know, that's just like Pentecost. God tells us not to forsake the gathering of ourselves. And I think that there, there's a lot of reasons he's so wise. As I've learned psychology, I've learned that there are just many things that we're told to do in Scripture that are just good for us. Psychologists figured it out, but God said it. So as I watched it, I just thought those logs joined together. I want to call you to joining together today in asking for the Holy Spirit to fall on us and do work in our congregation, in our community, in our city in our country. That's coming. Just beware. Here it comes. It also struck me that as I sat there, well, actually, as I sat there and the fire got bigger, it also got louder, and there was just all this energy, and it wasn't still energy. It was just all this energy going, which I thought also was kind of interesting. But it so affected the atmosphere <laughs> that one of the cooks from the kitchen came out, turned this fan on, <laughs> and all of a sudden cold air was coming into the room, which didn't make me happy, but it told me that there was enough of a commotion, enough of a, um, enough of a change in the atmosphere, in the temperature, that somebody that was in another room noticed it made a difference. Is that not like the Holy Spirit? when the Holy Spirit is in us, especially when we are burning together, it changes the atmosphere. It changes the energy. It changes the temperature of the room. And it makes all the difference, as Pastor Jonathan said last week. It makes all the difference. In the media... I have noticed some things as I've seen things in our society change. I've noticed that often the changes that really are going to be made in a powerful way usually have been in a movie. I don't know if anybody else has ever noticed that. But I've noticed that some of these things that come up are in the movies. Like all this gender kind of stuff. There was a movie back before all that started that was powerful movie. And it started to make us think differently because they carry us along with a story. A story is a powerful thing. And so I'm not actually seeking to um, exegete scripture for you and, and dig deep into it. Pastors Naomi and Jonathan have already done that very capably, way better than I could, in my opinion. But they've done a really good job of, of explaining the theology and all that kind of stuff. So now I want to come. I want to bring it to life through a story and call us to action. That's what I want to do today. So I'm going to kind of hit on three things. We are not doing one main text because I'm going through the life of Peter. So we're going to be looking at, at a lot of scripture. There's going to be a lot of scripture because uh, they tell the story best. 
So there's, you're going to be listening to me reading a lot of scripture, but making comments in between. I hope that's okay with you if we do a lot of scripture this morning. God's words, living, powerful, act, more active than, and yes, more active than any, uh, no. His, his, yes, thank you. Whatever. You know the verse I'm talking about? The word of God is powerful. Goodness sake, this always happens to me when I stand in front of people. So we're going to get to know Peter just a little bit. I'll be just looking at some scriptures along the way. Then we're going to look at three passages that I'm, I'm going to rest on for a few minutes and so that we can kind of get a feel for him more. We're not looking to learn about Peter, but he's going to help us understand the Holy Spirit more, the work of the Holy Spirit. And finally, I am going to call for a response to the Spirit of God. And my heart prayer is that right now you are hearing from the Holy Spirit. Even if you forget my words, may you never forget what the Spirit has to say to you. So last week, I, I, there's three quotes from, from the two of you that I want to bring out because I love them. The first one is, Pastor Jonathan last week said, if you declare the Word of God, it is the work of the Spirit. Do you have opportunity to do that sometimes? If not, there will be time to be able to pray about that at the end of my sermon. He also said the Spirit will make all the difference. Oh my goodness. I realized as I've been preparing for this, one night I was probably stressing about it, and uh, up yeah, I think it was the middle of the night, actually, and praying. And as I prayed through, I realized that I'm, I don't know that I'm boring without the Spirit, probably not my personality to be boring, but I'm certainly not powerful. But the Spirit of God is powerful, and I need Him to be here, present, working, while I speak, because it's His Word that needs to come out. And then Pastor Naomi said, the Spirit brings the presence of God. It's about the Spirit. Otherwise, we're just, we're just marking time. But we're not, because the Spirit of God is here. So let's get to know Peter just a little bit. I see some threads as I read through the Gospels and Acts. The first one, for me, is most striking. He caught many rebukes from Jesus. He is always getting in trouble. His mouth got him in a lot of trouble. I understand, Peter. <laughs> there are times where, where I, I never should speak in front of a crowd without notes in my hands, because I will stick my foot in my mouth. I had occasion to do that. A week ago on Friday, I believe it was, we had an orientation day. And uh, so the faculty that teach the first years were all speaking. And uh, Pastor Jonathan and I happened to be in the faculty that teach the first years. So he'd been before me, and he mentioned that it took him 15 years to get the education he got. So, like Peter, in an impulsive moment, I thought, I'm going to crack a joke about I got, to, I got the PhD done in 14 and a half years, and maybe that makes me smarter than him. I started saying that, and as, as my mouth is talking, my brain is going, stop it, stop it, stop it, but my mouth had taken over by then, and it's coming out of my mouth, and, and I'm thinking, okay, i got to turn this around, i got to turn this around, and so then I kind of flipped around when I was done with that sentence, and I was saying, no, I would never want to say that, I especially wouldn't want to say that about Dr. Kinsler, but by then everybody was laughing too hard, and nobody heard me getting humble at the end of it. My mouth went into action before my brain was engaged, and that happened to me. It happens to me, and happened to Peter, too. I understand Peter. That's one of the threads I see over and over and over again. I think he rebuked, Jesus rebuked him more than any other disciple. I don't know, know if any of them ever were rebuked, actually. He made many mistakes, many blunders, Gethsemane. Oh, let me cut that ear off for you. 
Jesus had fixed that. He had protective love. You will never suffer. This will never happen. Get thee behind me, Satan. Wow, that's quite a statement. Who would, the audacity of somebody that would rebuke Jesus. He knew who he was because he'd said it. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he still thought he could rebuke him. I really think that was mouth in action before brain and gear, as I see it. Another thread that I see is that Jesus rescued, redeemed, rebuked, and taught Peter. Peter seemed to get the attention from Jesus. Jesus rebuked him, but that's what God does for those that he loves. He disciplines us as a father disciplines his son. And so he was rebuked and he was taught by Jesus. What a great place to be. What a great place to be. And it was seen because he was just an out there kind of guy. His flaws were on the outside. I can understand Peter. So Jesus is expressing his love through Peter by correcting him over and over and over. Peter was also an unspoken leader among his peers. If you look around, if you look at what it was like for Peter or how he acted, it, was always, it always seemed to be him that stood up and said whatever he had to say, sometimes better than others. Matthew 26, 40 to 41 says, and he came, so this is Gethsemane. It's a dark hour. Did I get the right place? It's a dark hour for Peter, for Jesus. And he's asking the disciples to please pray with me while I go there and pray. So, so he goes off and prays, comes back, and there are his faithful disciples asleep. And he asked them, can't you get up and pray? He asked them to pray again. He went away to pray. He came back. And in verse 40, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation for this let me get it right. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So I think Peter demonstrated that in my opinion. It's also noteworthy to me that he talked to Peter. They all fell asleep, but Jesus talked to Peter. I don't know if he had at some time just put him in charge of the stay awake crew but he talked to Peter. He was weak in the flesh. He was also audacious. He had audacity. Mark 8, 31 to 33 tells that he, he began, beca Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and then after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And here's Peter. He took him aside. There it is. And rebuked him. Peter, sa P Peter said, well, he rebuked him. And Jesus, I, maybe I'll stay with the text here. <laughs> Turning and seeing his disciples. Where am I? Maybe I'll stay with this. <laughs> You can follow me, I'll try to. He said plainly, and Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him, but turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter often was a protecting kind of guy. He had a protective love. Problem, speaking before thinking. And Peter was rebuked one more time. We see that, that he often said things that brought that kind of rebuke. But we also see the thread of protective love. 
It's easy for me because I recognize so many of his flaws. It's easy for me to write Peter off. And yet there were good things. Yet I'm not complimenting him yet. Peter was inconsistent. He walked on water and sank in the water. He said he would stand up for Jesus and never betray him and then betrayed him later in the day. He was inconsistent, but he had faith in Jesus and he knew who he was. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's Matthew 16, verse 16. And Jesus in that moment recognized the work of God that was happening in Peter already. Let's bring him, come back, now come to the inconsistency of Peter. More. So Peter denies that he knows Jesus. I'm going to read that text. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. So very confident and so very wrong. Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And then all the disciples said the same thing. Then things happened, and the time came that Jesus had talked about. Now Jesus is going off to be crucified. Verses 69 to 75 of Matthew 26. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him saying, You also were with the Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you're saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. Funny how we go third person when we're needing to protect ourselves. Could I say that? And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then Peter began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Like, it wasn't even a sheepish denial. This was, like, noisy, powerful. Immediately, a roaster, a roaster. A, there's no roaster in those times. I don't think so. A rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the roaster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. His inconsistency was not lost on him, and he was repentant. He loved Jesus. He just didn't do very good then, and his mouth got him in trouble again. But his repentance was sincere. His spirit was willing. His flesh was weakened, his flesh was weak, and his resolve was re weakened by the flesh. I think one of the beautiful things that Jesus did was the redemptive experience afterwards when he offered Peter an opportunity to three times say what was true. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I love you. Feed my lamb. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I love you. Feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? 
you know all things, you know that I love you and feed my lambs. I just think that there was the beautiful redemptive moment between Jesus and Peter in that, in that, a lot of times, but in that time where Jesus cared about him, he taught him, he rescued him at times, and he did redemptive work in Peter's life, and it was going to get better. Finally, my fourth point, the climax, Pentecost, starring the power of the Holy Spirit. That might sound like my silly side coming out, which is easy to do, but I'm actually quite serious about that. As I prepared for this, at, at some point I was praying through it, and I realized that I had gotten stuck on the story of Peter, which is important to understand the work of the Spirit, but the main point here is the work of the Spirit. Pentecost, what the Spirit can do in a life that is sold out and actually where you receive the Holy Spirit. I look at Peter, I see the threads in his life, the outspoken the leader in him, the, not the rebukes, because when the Spirit came, God took all those strengths in Peter's personality and put them under the power of the Holy Spirit, and suddenly he's dramatically changed in very important ways. But it was the Spirit. The Spirit is the star of our story. Peter was just fortunate that he got chosen. So let's read the story, and I know that it was used last week, but I want to read the story again, looking at Peter and what he did. So there's a lot of scripture in this because I want to pull things out of this, this text here. So Acts 2, verses 1 to 25. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all gathered together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Mighty rushing wind. That changed the sound atmosphere. And divided tongues as, as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That would have changed the noise level. Would have changed the atmosphere. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That's a lot of people, I'm guessing. And at this sound, a multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cap Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Why are those names so hard to say? And there's more. Free Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome. Lots of languages, both Jews and proselytes, Christians, Arabian, Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. Peter stands up, not put off by the mockers, and he starts to speak. This same man who walked on water until he didn't, who said he'd never betray Jesus until he did, had all these inconsistencies where he was going to do something and something went wrong. Peter stands up in the face of all these people, the mockers, 
the perplexed, the amazed. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Sounds like authority. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But what was uttered through the prophet Joel... And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirits, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Yeah, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's powerful. That's the work of the Spirit. I just think, Lord... Can you do that here? Can you do that here? Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us. Work through us. That was Peter. He stood up as a leader, and he was bold, even to the point of confronting the crowd. Here it comes, Acts 3, 9 to 16. And all the people saw him walking and praising God after Peter and John had healed the lame person. They saw him walking, praising God, and recognizing him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms, and were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to this lame man. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, thank you, people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's, And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people yet again. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? Now God gets the glory. The God of Abram, the God of Jacob, and the God of Sorry, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servants, Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he, deci- when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Oh, my goodness. Pretty straightforward, hey? And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this, we are all witnesses. And in his name, by faith in his name, he has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man perfect health in the presence of you all. Authority, boldness, outspoken, the Spirit of God took this man or came into this man who was just blundering all the time and filled him and put authority in him and used him powerfully. This man who was so scared around a campfire that he denied Jesus three times now stood up and said, you killed him. The Spirit makes all all the difference. What has he done for you? Have you seen that kind of power in your life? I, th- I think sometimes you don't. When I was um, going to Bible school, I was there for a year and a half. I actually hated it. Believe it or not, yes, I teach in a Bible school now. But when I first went, I just hated it there. Everybody else thought I should be there, that I was called of God. I just didn't seem to know the same thing as everybody else, and I didn't agree. So I lasted a year and a half, 
And I left to go home, and my pastor sat me down to correct me and get me to stop trying to come home. And I said to him, no, I'm not going back until I know that God is calling me. And it took two years. And during that two years, I had an experience with God where I saw, it was, it was everything with me is visual. I saw a puppy. This puppy was brown, with big brown eyes. In pain, those eyes, those eyes were just filled with pain. And I realized that the puppy had been so broken, like a steamroller had rolled over the puppy. And I just, I have, I love animals and have I, th this compassion for animals. I don't know why. Don't think it's spirit given. I just naturally just love animals. And so my automatic instinct was to want to scoop it up in my hands and hold the puppy close to my heart. I knew that broken bones all over his body needed to be healed, held in tension to be healed and put back together, right? But I also knew that that couldn't happen yet. I just wanted the puppy to trust me. So I held the puppy close to my heart. And I realized in that moment, all of a sudden, that that is God to me. I've been so broken, all kinds of abuse, bullying, you name it. I was broken by life, by life, as a child and a youth. And God saw my pain. He saw my brokenness. And he scooped me up and held me close to his heart. And I did not even realize at the time that he was, someone is having trouble hearing me, if we could turn it up just a little bit. I realized at the time, or I didn't realize at the time, that he actually took that moment to fill me with his spirit. It was just an amazing time that I had with the Lord. I didn't know how much I had been changed, actually, in that moment until... God called me back to Bible school. My pastor said, I was talking to him, and he said, okay, Kath, I'm going to tell you what you're telling me. You're not going to be happy till you're in ministry, and the only way to get there is go back to Bible school. Not really what I wanted to hear said, but he was absolutely right. And I changed my mind. I went back to Bible school. Here's the thing. People that knew me before I took the two years off were talking about how different I was. And I kept hearing that from people, that I was just really changed. I, I didn't change anything on purpose. I didn't even know I was changed. But the most amazing thing for me was I was in the Alliance College, and Alliance bred at the time, if I could call it that. And um, we, I went through accreditation, which is the PAOC licensed minister. And when we did that, there would be four people to interview us. There would be, if I can remember all the categories, um, somebody that would test you on ministry, test you, I do mean test you, test you on Bible knowledge, ask you about your personal life and calling, and of course I forget the fourth one, doesn't matter. So when, when they were asking me about my personal li life and calling and all that kind of thing, um, they asked me, have you been sanctified, which is, is the same as baptized by, by the Spirit, received the baptism of the Spirit. And I said yes. And I told them about how God had spoken to me. When I finished talking, one of the people that was there testing me, I felt tested, um, when one of the people was there talking with me, he spoke up. He had traveled with me in my first year, I went on a, a quartet thing, traveling around Canada and singing every night. It was glorious, um, except for him. <laughs> um, he's just a really straight shooter. And so I was a bit immature, maybe multiplied by 10. And he saw it, and he confronted me on it. I remember him holding his finger in my face talking to me about my public flaws. My flaws are all public, just like Peter. I remember him talking to me about that. I started to cry. I actually left. I didn't even know where I was going. I looked back on it and think, think, what were you thinking? You were not thinking. This man that I had that experience with 
was sitting there. He sprung to life, and he said he started to talk to the people about the changes that he'd said seen in me. And he talked and talked and talked and talked, and I had to pick my jaw up off the floor because I had no idea. I was shocked because I felt like he saw some of the worst of me. And he finished by saying, and what you see before you right now is the product of the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God can make dramatic changes in us. You don't have to ask him. He just does that. You can ask him. There's nothing you can't ask him. For Peter, he took a fearful guy and turned him into a bold, outspoken, courageous spokesperson. He took faltering faith and turned it into unequivocal strength and resolve to speak truth, even to the mockers. He took fear of suffering and in acts turned it to rejoicing that he could suffer for the name of Jesus. Is that dramatic? He took a fleshly protector and turned him into a person committed to God's purposes. He took compromising betrayal and turned him into someone that stood up and spoke truth. Even when he was telling a bunch of people they were all murderers. He was a leader by personality, but by the Spirit of God, he turned into an anointed, empowered, effective, spirit-empowered leader and speaker, a life transformed by the Spirit of God after he had been baptized by the Spirit in the Spirit. One more thing that I want to bring out. Acts 4.13. This verse has been one of those verses that's yellow in my Bible. It says, Now when they, they were brought before the priests, the temple guard, and the Sadducees, and it said, Now when they, after they had had this conversation where they were telling to be quiet, they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated, common men, and they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. The first day that that scripture sprung to life for me, I just thought, I want to be with Jesus. I want to be so close to him, so filled by his spirit, that maybe even, maybe not astonished, but maybe even being astonished because it was clear that I had been with Jesus. How about you? Do you want that? Do you want to have the spirit of God so alive in your life, such connection that people would see that you have been with Jesus. Is there anything better? My goodness, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness. I need to get more of those. It's a beautiful personality. It's a beautiful thing. I want people to know that I have been with Jesus. I want to ask you, do you want people to know that you've been with Jesus? Be filled with the Spirit of God. I'm inviting you to be filled with the Spirit of God. Do you have opportunities to share your faith? You know, sometimes it bothers me because I see quite a bit of transfer growth happening sometimes. But I often, in the places I've been, have not seen that many people coming to know Jesus. In me, that bothers me. And this morning, I'm going to be coming before the Lord to say, please give me an opportunity to be sharing my Jesus. And I know that there are many of you here that have been filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit. And I know that there are some of you here that have opportunity to share Jesus with people. But I'm guessing that maybe I'm not the only one 
that would like to see more of that in my life? What's your desire? I want to invite you not just to come to the altar. I am inviting you to come to the altar if you want to do some business with God. Be baptized by the Spirit. Ask for opportunities. Ask for God to change you. Bring fears that or sins that are blocking the work of the Lord in your life. I'm not just asking you to come to the altar. I'm asking you to join me at the altar. We've got seats in the front. We've got places where you can kneel or stand, whatever you want to do. We need a fresh wind. That fire that I sat and watched yesterday, as the logs burned out, the flames went down. And I know the flue was open that kept the wind coming in there, and they needed to come together and get the logs burning brighter. They needed God. They needed the logs needed to just get together and get brighter. We need God to bring us together and to send a fresh wind of his spirit. Acts 1, 4 to 5 says, Wait for the gift my father. Jesus said to them, Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus invites you to Laodicea, a lukewarm church. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with him, that, with that person, and they with me. Dinner with the Spirit of God. Do you want it? Do you want to see people coming to know Jesus? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? You come too if you want to know him as your Savior. Please come join me at the altar if you so choose. starts to break wearing there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is love Strong shine through the 
Keep this place open um, as a place of prayer, as a place of surrender. Um, but you are welcome to go to the potluck. Um, just make sure that if you do, that you don't have unfish- unfinished business. Um, yeah, and if you do go, please be respectful of um, uh, this atmosphere. We want to keep it peaceful. And um, yeah, so I'll just quickly pray for the food, and then you're welcome to go. Um, so, Father God, thank you for. Thank you for the response that you've brought today. Thank you that you have touched people today. And um, thank you for the wisdom that Dr. Taff has brought. Lord, I ask that as we go from here and as we enjoy a meal together, it would be a good time of fellowship. Um, that you would bless everybody who brought food and you would bless it to our bodies. Um, yeah. And may we just, may we feel more of your spirit from here on out. In Jesus' name. Amen.